Ukrainian cinema, which on many occasions surprised the world viewing audience, began to rapidly grow in the 1920s. This decade was marked by the number of Ukrainian films produced, the expansion of subjects, the enrichment of the genre palette, and the emergence of talented directors, operators, and actors on the movie scene. Such positive shifts were not by accident. To be sure, they contributed to the autonomous status of domestic cinema in Ukraine. Since 1922, the All Ukrainian Photo Cinema Management, Ukrainian acronym VUFKU, which was an independent economic and legal entity, officially began operating in Ukraine. The analog of today's cinema, but in addition to today's cinema, it was an analog of today's Goskino state cinema, but unlike in the present-day Goskino, there were no state subsidies, as there were no funds for that. This matter was resolved rather simply, albeit in a very clever way. Maria Andreeva, a girlfriend of Maxim Gorky, helped out by buying a package of German films for rental while in Berlin. One of the packages was immediately sold to Russia, seeing as Ukraine enjoyed cultural autonomy. In this way, startup capital was raised. And by 1930, for eight years, the Vufku achieved remarkable success. The management built a studio. There were actually called film factories in those times. They made films and funded their shooting. Moreover, the films were of the elite class, or as they call it today, art house. Also, they were oriented toward the mass viewing audience. In a word, it was a very comprehensive program. Wufku made great money at that time. A million gold rubles a year. The best creative frames were attracted after the other. Writers, artists, photographers were hired to work in cinema. For example, Alexander Dovzhenko was a painter, Ivan Kavalaridze, a sculptor, Les Krubas, a theater director, and the operator Danilo Demutsky, a photographer. So Demutsky was a well-established photographer and he achieved considerable success. He was even awarded prizes at one of the Parisian exhibitions and so on. And the focus of his photos was on Ukrainian space. He surprisingly reproduced Ukrainian landscapes and all its corporal fillings, including women's bodies. We saw this all later in the film The Earth, which he shot with Dovzhenko. There is a well-known famous episode, which was then cut due to the censorship at the time. The naked bride of Vasily dies from the gunshot of a night killer, and she runs to and fro around the room. In his photographs and in this episode there is not a single hint of cynicism, and in this episode plastic and the power of space corporeality are used to convey a certain message to the viewing audience. The young writers Yuri Yanovsky, Mikola Bajan, Petro Panch, Georg Krupi, Grigory Kosinka, Alexander Kornichuk, Isaac Babel, and many others became scriptwriters. Foreign specialists were also invited to participate. Artists were invited from Germany, headed by an extremely talented and experienced specialist named Heinrich Weissenherz and several more German artists. Museum Bay, a German-Turkish director, appeared in Odessa. Along with two other famous figures, Marius Gold and Joseph Rona. Rona was a particularly valuable figure. He was not a great artist, but he had a number of years of experience in Hollywood, not to mention in German film studios. He was a director and a cameraman, but apparently the greatest contribution to the work of the Odessa film studio was made by the outstanding artisan of Russian cinema, Pyotr Cherdinin. I say the artisan not at all in an offensive tone. He did not make films that became treasures in cinematic art. But Cherdinin was one of the first Russian filmmakers who learned to professionally shoot streaming film products. 16 films were filmed at the Odessa Film Factory by director Pyotr Cherdinin. The best of them is the film of the adventure genre Ukrazia, which appeared on the big screen in 1925. 
про боротьбу там зі шпіонажем, значить. His film Ukrazia about the fight against espionage and adventures of the times of the civil war in Soviet territory enjoyed great success. It was shown in the Netherlands, Germany and France. There were many different effects, many expositions, attempts and intentions to penetrate the inner world of a spy. There were many interesting elements in this film. Another film by Pyotr Chardin entitled Tara Shevchenko was released in 1926. For the first time on the big screen, the events of the life of the great poet were brought to life. He was a strong professional, and he ventured to make the film Tara Shevchenko. It was a biographical movie about the great poet. He invited Ambrosi Buchma to play the lead role. Moreover, this film was made for an adult audience, and then he made the film title Young Taras, which was edited from the same footage, but especially for a children's audience. The domestic cinema of that time made the Ukrainian actor Ambrosi Buchma, who came from the Berezil theater of Les Corbas, extremely popular. Ambrosi Buchma was the lead actor of not just some theater, but the Berezil theater headed by Les Kurbas. Nevertheless, he eventually left the theater and for five years devoted himself only to cinema. Ambrosi Buchma proved to be the most needed actor in the cinema of the 1920s to 1930s. He starred in more than 50 films. In the audience's view, there was an impression that Buchma should be present in all the films that were released on the big screen in those years. He was in such great demand at that time that the audience did not understand how a film can be released and Buchma does not play in it at all. Well, they just came and asked, when will Buchma play in the film? They were used to it. After all, he starred in 50 movies. Ambrosi Buchma's role of Hordi Yaroshchuk in the film directed by her Hitachi nightcap driver was absolutely brilliant. In order to save his daughter from the influence of the Bolsheviks, the protagonist led counterintelligence offers to them. Then one intelligence officer shoots her dead. Досить примітивізована історія, яку Бучма зіграв як геніальну трагедію батьківської любові. It is a rather primitive story, but Bushma expressed it as an ingenious tragedy of her father's love, a terrible, fatal love that destroyed his own child. The film is filled with many interesting figurative techniques, and it is obvious that for the first time in Ukrainian cinema it was built on the methods of a dynamic camera and a subjective camera. In the plot of the movie Nightcap Driver, Buchma revived an old trick when the cameras are constantly in motion inside the cab and together with the acting cast. This is when the viewer sees the city through the eyes of the protagonist together with his tragic and mesmerizing gaze of sorrow. The director managed to recreate the atmosphere in which everything around supposedly sympathizes with the hero of Buchma. There are a lot of tricks there. So the unhappy father is walking and an old wretched and unfortunate nag follows him with the same gait. It is obvious that she is already worn out. Director Yorhi Dawson and the main actor Ambrose Buchma ruined the scheme proposed by the Russian film director of Sevalod Podolkin in the film The Mother, based on the novel by Maxim Gorky. According to her, the little man should have joined the revolutionary struggle. But in the movie Nightcap Driver, an ordinary person, on the contrary, does not want to go through any unnecessary revolutionary shocks. Here there are elements of criticism of this revolutionary totality, because Ambrose Bushma plays someone who finally realizes that revolution is not a good thing and is not the right solution. In the 1920s to 30s, the real national cinema art was being born in Ukraine, which tried to put its meaning into the universal notions and images of the universe, such as home, earth, water, tree and fire. An active search for cinema language was in progress at the time. The originators of such cinema art were the filmmakers Les Kurbas, Alexander Dovzhenko and Ivan Kavalyridze. Ivan Kavalyridze, who came to Ukrainian cinema from sculpture and plastic arts at the turn of the 20s and 30s, offered an amazing voice and an amazingly integral image of the Ukrainian past. 
образ українського минулого. Kalaridze's first film was the drama The Pouring Rain, based on the poem Haidamake by Taras Shevchenko. The film was created in 1929. The idea was an uprising of the Ukrainian people and their struggle against national oppression. The director, with his intrinsic innovations, created an artistic image of the land that feeds us all. Так от, коли знімалася злива, то це була кімната, малесенька кімната, але знімалася So when the burning rain was shot, it was in a small room. The scene plowman was shot with oxen and his chaser. Відгортають скибу землі. Скиба землі це They turned up the scum of the earth. Була вимощена з дерева. On a floor made of wooden slabs. It was tied up with a transparent piece of cloth. Такою прозорою тканиною зафактурена і разом з тим оця велика скиба This large chunk of earth, turned over by the plow in this frame, made a fantastic impression. I asked Ivan Petrovich, why not ordinary earth? Why did you make such an artificial structure in order to express the image of the earth? He said that ordinary earth would simply crumble, and I needed an illusion of the motherland, which is mighty rich, fertile soil. There is no such soil as Ukrainian black earth anywhere else in the world. Incidentally, all world film critics, the film was indeed shown all over the world, marked this frame, described it, and analyzed from all possible angles. In 1930, on the 10th anniversary of the capture of Perkop, the following film by Ivan Kavalaridze, Perkop, appeared. The revolutionary events of the 1920s became a reason for the director to reproduce dramatic conflicts in the history of Ukraine. Perkop became a symbol of Ukrainian overcoming their hardships over the long, and difficult period of the 17th to 20th centuries. This is contemporary material about the siege of Crimea by the Red Army, the siege of Perkop and so on. But at the same time, this is the immersion and projection of the present in the historical plane. It is an interconnection and creation of a single historical space from which the image and myth of the nation arises. Без чого не, не виникає образ е, і міф нації. In the late 1920s to early 1930s, a large number of highly artistic or simply highly professional film work was produced. Among them were Arsenal and Earth by Alexander Dovzhenko, Fata Morgana, under the work of the same name created by Mihaly Kotsubinsky and directed by Boris Tiahno, the screenplay of Vladimir Sassura's story Taras Trasilo, filmed by Peter Cherdinin, Two Days by Herohi Stabovi, Karmeluk by Favs Lopatinsky and many others. Ukrainian film production was concentrated at the Odessa and Yalta film studios. In December 1928, the Kiev Film Factory began its work. Despite the autonomy and relative freedom of creativity, there was a censorship of nonetheless. In Ukrainian cinematography, they removed suspicious snippets of films and in many cases send them to gather dust. Звичайно, і на рівні вувку іноді заборонялися картини, як це трапилось, наприклад, із Of course, some movies were banned at the level of Vufka. This is what happened, for example, with Alexei Kapler, who was famous in the film industry in the 1930s. He worked as an assistant with Dovzhenko on the shooting of Arsenal. And then he made two films as a director. Both of them were banned and shelved. One of them we can see today. Its title was The Right to a Woman. Apparently it was forbidden because it contained very free ideas about women, about their freedom, about how society limits their freedom, and so on. But according to film experts, Ukrainian cinema at that time differed from Russia's in that the ideological attack on the audience was less aggressive. Теоретики і практики французької нової хвилі показали, що, скажімо, той же Ізенштейн і його Theoreticians and practitioners of the French New Wave have shown that Eisenstein's manner of work, his theory and practice, is manipulative editing. This is an aggressive attack on the human consciousness. So it is edited here with short plans, short pieces, so that the audience could not understand what happens within three to four seconds. In this way, they fall into the millstone of the director's pressure. There is no such thing in Ukraine, so film editing is a much less turbulent and relatively smoother process here. It is the softened ideological envelope, 
the higher artistic level of films that allowed Ukrainian cinema to reach the world level and be allowed to be shown on the big screen in many different countries. Ukrainian films in the 1920s were sold to Europe, to European countries, and it means that they basically opened the window of opportunity to Western Europe. The short existence of Ukrainian cinema in the conditions of cultural autonomy has shown amazing results in the creation of its own film industry. Several domestic films were released for showing in local movie theaters every week. They managed to form the screen image of our country and its historical development as a well-defined picture of the national world and its self-development. But in 1930, the Ukrainian cinema received a crushing blow. The leaders of the USSR, concerned about the lack of control over film production in Ukraine by the party and the state, subordinated it to Moscow. It is precisely from this time when the decline of Ukrainian cinema, the repression against the figures of culture and attempts by the authorities to keep cinema in the so-called socialist realism, all began. <laughs>